you know, I forget every year who our veterans are. Would you stand up if you're a veteran, please, just so we can honor you? One, two, three, four. There we go. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for your sacrifice of service. We appreciate you. Well, today we are continuing in our series on our responsibilities to each other. Last time we got together, we talked about how we are members of one another, how we are connected. We are to function as a unit, as a body, as an ensemble, as a family. We belong to each other. So today we talk about the most prominent one, and that is to love one another. Now, Peter... The Apostle Peter says that we are strangers and aliens. And some of us are stranger than others. Is that not true? Have you come across Christians that you would say, now that's a strange person? Well, I think so. So I ask you this question. Under what circumstances do you find it more difficult to love other believers? Now, I know that if you're like me, you've got to have trouble loving some people. There are some circumstances which makes that more difficult. Let's look at some of those things. Well, when they are unlikable or obnoxious. Yes, there are obnoxious Christians. Uh, I've come across them, and you probably have too. Hopefully, you don't put me in that category. (laughs) But... There are those people, nonetheless, and there are those who have wronged us personally. And perhaps they have never apologized. They have said something. They have done something to you. And so you say, I don't like them. I don't really love them. I love them by faith, but I don't like them. Then there are those who are choosing not to live under the lordship of Christ as disciples in clear biblical orthopraxy, which means right practice. And so they profess to be believers. I talked to a guy this week who was talking about a particular politician and said, that guy can't be a Christian because he said this and this. And I said, oh, wow, you have the ability to judge whether someone is or isn't a believer. That's amazing because I don't have that ability. And yet... The statement just shows how there are people who can call Jesus their Savior and yet still not live in a practical way under the Lordship of Christ. Then there are those that we disagree with on issues of theology, what we would call orthodoxy, or politics. And has this not come up? Is that not where we are right now? Uh, It's interesting, Susan... uh, came back and said that she had a couple of situations where she found about some, out about some people who appear to be Christians, but man, what they were saying politically is like totally different than what the group as a whole would have said. And it's like, oh, I really have trouble with people who hold those positions. So we, we struggle with these things, don't we? Let's be honest, we do. With these people who say one thing and yet, oh, it doesn't seem to line up. Well, what we're going to look at today is as we go through the scriptures, we're going to see some different things, seven different things that uh, we need to understand about loving one another. Here's the first one. The command to love one another has consistently been taught from the beginning. This is not a new teaching. It's taught in the Old Testament that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, And this is what it says in 1 John 3.11. For this is the message which we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now remember, when we're talking about love one another's, we're talking about those within the family of God. We are also to love those outside the family of God. But we're to especially make sure that we are loving God's family members, our spiritual siblings. Here's the second one. Loving one another fulfills the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? In John 13, 34 and 35, he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That's not a new commandment. Even as I have loved you. Ah, now that's what makes it a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. 
By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. But here in John in Romans, Paul says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. That's an interesting idea. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. So if you owe something to someone, you have a debt. Would you agree with that? All right. So to whom do you owe the debt? Do you owe it to that person? Are you obligated to them for something? Or are we indebted to God? I think they're really, we're indebted to God. We, we owe it to him. He has forgiven us. He has given us grace and mercy, forgiveness. We are to pass that on to others. Here's the third one. It is the Lord's will for our love for one another to increase and abound. In other words, don't be content with the love you have. It should increase. It says in 1 Thessalonians, And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. So Paul is speaking about he and his associates. We love you. We are abounding in our love for you. You love one another. That's good, but don't settle. Abound. Go further, more and more. Think about how to encourage others to provide loving and good deeds to fellow believers. In Hebrews 24 and 25, this is a very important passage for us. It says, let us to, how to consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. In other words, I'm supposed to say, hey, Richard, here's a great way that you can love Bobby. He's having trouble opening his car door because of his sore shoulder. Why don't you go open the door for him? Okay, now... His, his shoulder is getting better. He played golf recently, so I know it's getting better. <laughs> he wouldn't answer the question when I asked him, did you give yourself a higher handicap when you played that round of golf? But anyway, he is getting better. But we are to say, hey, here's a way that you can love that person. Uh, here's, here's, uh, they're in financial trouble right now. Uh, how about all of us chip in and help that person? That's a way that we do that. So that's a very practical thing. We are to stimulate one another to love others. Not just do it ourselves, but stimulate others to do it for other people as well. Fervency of our love for one another should also come from the heart. Now, this is an interesting notion because I will tell you this. In conversations that I have, especially with men, we talk about what does it mean to love others? And when we first hear that in a Western civilization context, especially America, we think of it in terms of an emotion. And so we, consequently, if we only see it as emotion, then we say, well, then once I don't have that feeling for someone else, I have no obligation to them. Well, love is both an action and an emotion. But here what we see is what we see and Peter is telling us, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another. He could have stopped there, but he went further from the heart. So we are to have people on our hearts. There is to be some emotion, but it's to be fervent. It's to be fervent. And I think the reason he says that is because he knows that our nature is, is when, when we have someone on our heart, it's easier to do things for them and to show those loving actions. It's the same way in our relationship with God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And what does the Lord require of you? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be on your heart. God knows if they're on your heart, it's not going to be obligatory. Oh, I got to do this. So just as we love God from our hearts, we obey him from our hearts. It's the same in our relationship with people. We need to have them on our hearts. Now, that's harder to actually pull off than just doing a loving deed. But both are important. 
Here's the sixth one. Our love for one another must be fervent. It covers over a multitude of sins. Above all, Peter says, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. When you love someone, you are willing to put up with their, mm, their idiosyncrasies. We learn this in marriage, don't we? Why do you squeeze the tube of toothpaste in the middle and not the end? Okay, if you love someone, you're going to put up with those little things. Okay, great illustration. Andy's love for Barney on the Andy Griffith Show. Barney was always goofing up and Andy was covering for him all the time. There's a great episode where, where, Bar where Andy and Helen are caught in a cave. And they finally make their way out. But Barney's organized a search of the whole town to find them. And when Andy goes back and hears what's going on, he goes, we got to go back and get in that cave so Barney can save us. <laughs> can you imagine how embarrassed he's going to be in the eyes of everybody in town if, if there's no one there to be rescued? So they put their dirty clothes back on and they go back and climb into the cave and Barney saves them. And Barney's the hero. And this is just typical of what he does. He, he puts up with Barney and he covers for him. Why? Because he's his friend. He loves him. And so this is important. And the seventh one is this. Our love for one another should be devoted like that for a family member and lead us to humbly give them preference. Now, family members have a kind of a love. It's a love because of. I love you because you're my family member. You're my brother. You're my cousin. You're my uncle. You're my father or mother. And so, you know, it's interesting. You've, you've heard this before, that, that there are different words in the Greek New Testament for love. And they represent different kinds of love. Of course, there's agape love, the love that's unconditional, the love that God has for us. But there's also a brotherly love, and it's a love because of. I love you because you're my brother. That's the word. The word Philadelphia comes from this term, brotherly love, the city of brotherly love. I don't know how loving Philadelphia is anymore, but that's where their name comes from. So we are to be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another. In other words, we, we let them take, the, take a prominence. You know, we've seen this before. Two people walk up to the door at one time and the person goes, oh, here, you go ahead. You go ahead of me. Or, or you're standing in a checkout line and you're waiting and you're like the third person in line and somebody comes up with one item. And you say, here, why don't you, you go ahead of me. You just have the one item. That's giving preference to them. You could say, well, I'm not, I'm not letting somebody cut into my, in front of me. But you give preference. In other words, you, you let them have their way. There are times that we do that, when we can do that and not violate Scripture. But look at Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Wow, this is such a key reference. Wow, let's pick this apart. Don't do anything from selfishness. See, this is our default nature, is it not? To be selfish to want what we want? You know, I deal with this all the time when I talk to pastors. You know, someone goes, well, I don't like that music. Or I don't like the way we do music. Or I don't like the way he preaches. Or I don't like the way that da 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 da. All of this is I don't like. This isn't my preference. So you should do what I want. Well, when you got a whole church full of people that are doing that, it's like, come on. You're going to have battles going on constantly. So don't be selfish and don't be conceited. And, that, and those two things are, are related together. The contrast is humility. Don't be conceited, but be humble of mind and regard others as more important than yourselves. You know, James talks about this. You know, somebody comes into your church and they're dressed in really nicely. Oh, you come on and sit up here. You come sit up here in a place of prominence. And now, now you in, in poor ragged clothing, you go sit in the back. You go sit in the back of the church. 
Okay, that doesn't mean those of you sitting in the back are ragged. <laughs> we have not asked those people in the back row to sit back there. I want you to know. But it's because you're trying to give preference to them because of their status of who they are. Okay, and that would be wrong in the church. So these are seven things that we see specifically about loving one another. But I want to accentuate this a little bit more as we look at this. How does this relate to us today? Well, we must understand that loving others is taking beneficial action toward their welfare, irrespective of our emotions. When you love someone, you are treating them in a beneficial way. You are concerned about their welfare. This is why sometimes you have to confront someone with the truth that they don't want to hear. And it seems to them, it might seem unloving, but it is ultimately loving. This is why you confront people about sin. This is why you speak the truth to one another in love, because you're concerned about them, not because you're trying to fault find, but because you're honestly concerned about them. We choose to love others by our actions, but loving others with the heart does involve some emotion. There should be a little emotion in there. So that, you know, it, it, it's not important that we, we live devoid of any emotion. Emotion is okay. We don't run our life by emotions. This is what happens in many marriages. I don't feel love for you anymore, so I guess I don't love you anymore. So I'm going to move on. That's the wrong way to be. Okay? Here's the third thing. We must overcome our greatest enemies. We have three great enemies that we battle with every day. One is within ourselves, our flesh, our sinful nature. We battle with that because it wants us to be selfish and want everything to go our way. We battle that. We battle the devil. And we battle the world system that Satan directs. And so we have to do that. We have to battle with those things in order to place others above ourselves. Have it your way. You deserve it. You know, that's, no, that's not right. And so if we go into that attitude in our relationships, man, it's just not going to work out. Number four, we must be willing to provide personal time and energy to demonstrate our love to others. When you're worn out, when you are tired, and when you are so spent by doing other things that you don't have the energy to love other people. You know what it's like when you're sick, for example, and you don't feel well. You don't feel like being nice to people. Maybe it's just me. Am I the only one who does it? <laughs> I don't know. Susan tells me that's the way. No, I <laughs> We're all that way because we're focused on ourselves and our own pain. And listen, there are people that deal with pain all the time. Relational pain, physical pain that they go through, emotional pain. And they don't feel like being nice and loving to others. So we need to monitor ourselves and make sure that we have the time and the energy to demonstrate. Now that word demonstrates an important word. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. We must not allow our differences to drive us apart, but rather focus on what we share commonly in Christ. It would be so easy to pick on one thing that we don't agree on and let that be the focus of our division. Rather than saying, what do we celebrate together? What are the essentials of our Christian faith that we all agree on? Let's not get in fights over the little things. Let's celebrate the things that we do agree on. Okay? Now, Tina Turner came out with a song called What's love got to do with it? Do you remember hearing that on the radio? What's love got to do, got to do with it? I'm not going to say, I'm not, I'll, 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 uh, sorry. What's love but a secondhand emotion? Okay, but do you also remember the song? This is a chorus that we've sung, I'll bet at this church multiple times. Have you, do, you, do you, look at the lyrics, have you, do you remember singing this song? Beloved. 
Let us love one another. You know that chorus? Do you, shake your head if you do. Shake your head. Wake up if you're asleep. Okay. All right. All right. Will you sing it with me? Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7, and 8. Yeah, you learned the reference with the song, right? And, and so, but look at that. And this is the only time you'll hear me use Elizabethan language in a sermon. <laughs> but you learn it in the King James and it's just hard to get it away, uh, away from your mind on this. But look, if you are born of God, if you are born again, you will love God's children is what this is saying. And it shows not only are you born of him, but you know God. Now, what does that mean? To know God, God is love. God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God is love. And so if we profess to be his children, we should be loving as well. That's what this reference is talking about. I hope, you, I hope that, that song stays in your head today as you're thinking about the subject matter today. I came across this quote years ago by Francis Schaeffer, and I am not a Francis Schaeffer aficionado. Some people are. He's, he was way over my head. Okay, <laughs> I'm kind of put the cookies on the bottom shelf where everybody can get them kind of guy. You know, Jesus said, feed my sheep, not feed my giraffes. So I'm, I'm kind of keeping it down here. But this quote stayed with me. He is con giving a commentary on... Uh, John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Now catch the next part. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And here's what Schaefer said. The church is to be a loving church in a dying culture. This was written in the 1970s. How then is the dying culture going to consider us? Jesus says, by this all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love for one another. In the midst of the world, in the midst of our present dying culture, Jesus is giving a right to the world. Upon his authority, he gives the world to judge whether you and I are born again Christians on the basis of our observable Love toward all Christians. This is the whole point. The world is going to judge whether Jesus has been sent by the Father on the basis of something that is open to observation. The world should see love within the family of God. It must be demonstrable. It needs to be observable. So that means it's got to be actions. Those, those actions can be like what we saw in the early church in Acts 2, where they sold their possessions and gave the proceeds to people in their church body who had needs. It may mean that. It may mean giving somebody a tender hug when they have been suffering or taking food over to them. It could be any number of things, but the outside world should be able to see it demonstrated. They don't just see emotion. Oh, I love you. But they see some act of love that says that person is a disciple of Jesus. What does that mean? Because Jesus loved others. Because God loves others. We should love others. This is a very convicting statement, I think. Wow. The world has a perfect right to judge whether we're disciples of Jesus and whether the Father has sent Jesus to the world based on how we behave toward one another. 
And what do people say? You know, here's, here's the standards, standard line. Why is it that you get all these different denominations? Y'all can't get along. You got Baptists and Lutherans and Methodists and Episcopalians and Pentecostals and all these people. Y'all can't get along. Why should I want to become a Christian? You know what? We have a right to our own certain secondary doctrinal issues that may differ from one another. It doesn't mean that we don't get along with someone from another denomination. Would you agree with that? Okay, so, so we need to make sure that they know that, you know, yeah, we have some differences of viewpoints, but, it, but we still love each other. We can disagree agreeably with one another. And you're not judging them as being a reprobate because they don't agree with you on every single point of secondary doctrine. But the world, boy, they want to pick on that thing right there. Why do you have so many, you know, why do you have so many Baptist churches? A Baptist church right across the street from another Baptist church. Well, because that church split over the color of carpeting, and now you've got a second church. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's crazy. It's ludicrous. We cannot do that. So what needs to happen in your life to see an increase in your love for others? This is the biggest thing. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are to say, I want what I want. But if we're walking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, then when we do that, we will not carry out the desires of the flesh. As I was meditating on this, I, I, you know, I wanted to look at the full statement again on this. And what jumped out at me was the things that have to do with relationships. I've never looked at it that way. But this is something I drew out of the passage as I looked at it. So let's look at it. Paul gives a great contrast here. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. And you, let's read it out loud. We haven't read anything out loud yet. Let's go ahead and read this. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now we're going to read it slowly so it can sink in. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these things are, are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Stop. So the, the idea here is, you want to do things that please the Spirit, but you don't always do it. That's what he's, he's getting at here, okay? Now let's go on. Now, the deed... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me go back. I missed it. I'm sorry. I'm going to jump ahead. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And I think he's talking about the law of the flesh, to, to be selfish. Right, now we'll go on. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which... I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's a pretty nasty list of things. And I guess you could say, and I've, the ones in yellow are the ones that I saw that really seem to deal with relationships. Yes, you could say immorality, impurity, sensuality, and so forth could have a bearing on relationships. I get that. But, but look at this. Enmities. Enmities are, are, are like striving anger with one another, warring together. Enmity, strife, battling with one another. Jealousy. I want what you have. Outbursts of anger. This happens even in churches. Outbursts, uh, outbursts of anger. Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. All of these kinds of things... Can, can get into a relationship in the body of Christ and can tear it down. And it's easy. It's natural. Just do what's natural. That's what's natural. All these things are what comes naturally. All right? Don't do that. 
And then what he does is he gives the contrast. He gives, don't do that, do this. But, let's read this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. So look at the contrast. Don't live this way. This is what comes naturally. This list is supernatural living. How do we know it's supernatural? Because it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit creates these things within us to help us in our own Christian character that has a spill out over in our human relationships. So if we are, Paul is basically saying, well, look, now that you're a new creature in Christ, live in your new nature. Put to death that old nature. Say, no, I'm dead to that now. I'm dead to the jealousy. I'm dead to the envying. I'm dead to the outbursts of anger, the striving. I'm dead to that. I'm not going there. That's not me anymore. I'm living by my new nature, and I'm living by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have a choice to make. We can choose to live by the old nature, or we can choose to live by our new nature, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's our choice. But if we're living by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's going to show in our relationships with one another. Do you see how significant that is? I mean, that's really, that's really a profound idea. But we get to choose. The second thing is whatever our personal difficulties might be, we must strive to overcome them to demonstrate love to others. In other words, we've got to face the things that cause us to have trouble loving others. And we have to be willing to overcome them. If it's because someone's obnoxious or strange, we've got to put up with that. If it's because they've never apologized for something they've done to us, we need to forgive. Whatever it is, if, if we can't agree on every point of theology, that's okay. If they're not walking under the Lordship of Christ, we need to pray for them. We need to demonstrate what that looks like before them in our own lives. So the final thing is, when do you have the most trouble loving other Christian believers? And what do you need to do about that? Because there's a clear command from Old Testament and New that we are to love others. This is serious stuff. Because the world has a perfect right to judge us as unbelievers if we do not show love for one another. It needs to be demonstrable. So will we do that? That's the big question. We know we're to love one another, but there are barriers in us doing that. Will we face those, those reasons, overcome them, and work towards being loving towards one another? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you demonstrated your love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, you allowed Christ to die for us. We certainly did not deserve that love. We did not deserve your grace, your mercy, and yet you chose to set your affection on us when we were unlovable. So please help us to carry out these commands, to love others as you have given us uh, instructions to do. And may the world see that there is love within your family, believer to believer. And may that draw many people to you in salvation. We ask you for this. We thank you that you have provided the victory for us to walk in and the power to do it. And, but we need the conviction to draw upon that at the times that we need it. 
So we thank you and we pray towards your glory and we come to you only because of Jesus and what he's done for us. Amen.